Uh, today is August 29, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. Our agenda today is, uh, I put a suggestion to see if we can discuss uh, kind of a strategy to get uh, how to get Jordy Spencer and Jeff Hall on board on the Desiderata. And um, I just, I gave a few suggestions, but I'd also want to hear from everyone. Um, so currently right now, uh, Risa and, and A, um, we're all, and I, were kind of collaborating. Uh, Risa and A, I, from what I've seen in the emails, they've been watching um, the, uh, Jeff Hull's, uh the Jejun Institute and in Bright Axiom. So they've been doing their research and uh, yeah, we're, we're at a point where, well, I've been in communication with with Spencer and I think he's the best bet to get in contact with Jeff, but I still feel that uh, Spencer isn't uh, fully convinced or he, he still needs some guidance or some goading. I know Jordy, he's gonna be tough to crack and yeah, so uh, just wanting to hear from you all. So you sent him a request for the IP, right? The that we would license the IP. Well, if if he didn't actually mm. continue with the Latitude Society, and we just try. Right. Do you think? Do you, uh, I have we we haven't uh, done that yet because I I feel that if we do ask him, he, they're, they're gonna just say no, or I don't know, or should we, you, you think it's just best to, you know, I know you gave those three options, right? The ones, uh, and so whichever one they'll yeah, go thinking. for. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that is really what I ask. The other thing I've got to suggest is, if you look at the jejun.org, I think is the website where they have everything that Jeff Hull has done and all the way up to Signal. And I think the pages on the Latitude Society, there's, there's another woman who's an art director. I can't remember what her name is, but I think it might be Thacko or something like that. Um, but she, she also did a lot of the events and the kind of happenings at the Latitude Society. So I thought it might be worth trying to contact her. Yeah, I was um, doing some research on her too and uh, got a little background. Um, I think I sent in, uh, I said that uh, she's currently working with Disney but um, she's she has worked on other projects. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, projects. yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, but still it, don't um, know how to approach. We her. could ask her if mm -hmm. uh, maybe just a direct approach. Just say, has is, does Jeff Hall have an agent, or how does he operate? Does he have an agent or assistant? Because we want to. Ask him, you know, basically those three things. Say, so we, we, we really want to license all the stuff you've done. You know. or, and, you know, ask who owns all the... We assume that Jeff Hull owns all the intellectual property for the, for Jejun and for the Latitude Society and for Signal. And we want to license it. So who do we contact? Okay. Because we can't get through to Jeff. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, uh, Hugh, because uh, that was one of my questions is whether we should just do the direct approach or we should do more um, connecting in terms of um, aligning uh, or, or making them understand where we're coming from. But at this point, um, if we're short on time, yeah, maybe the direct approach would be um, would be beneficial because I wasn't sure if if you wanted us to share those three options with uh, just the people surrounding Jeff Hall or if those are things that are directly just for him and his agent 
to know. It's up to you, but yeah, I think I think we are running out of time. We've got to we've got to move on to find other people if we can't get these people. Are you looking at Meow Wolf as well? Yeah, I'm uh, looking at a few people out there. They're just also hard to get in contact with, but um, I'm trying to see who would be more aligned to our project because they they seem to be uh, this Meow crowd. They're um, they're different. They're a different group too with their own ideas and mindsets. So yeah, it's hard to find which, I think I'm, I'm being cautious because we've hit Jordy and Darren was tough. And yeah, I guess so I'm just trying to find people who'd be more aligned to what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, do more research on that. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah, you've got to either kiss a lot of frogs or otherwise basically spend a lot of time if one <laughs> a lot of time and attention. Um, I think it's between those two options. But yeah, there's also that arg. There's the the arg subreddit on, on Reddit. And those guys are doing stuff like that. I, I just posted one on XR Med um, where those guys yeah those guys are fully fledged you know talking about using chaos magic for culture change and stuff and they seem pretty well aligned whoever those guys are it was it was the something 23 um whatever the 23 secret society i, I presume it's something to do with robert anton wilson and those guys they were all about 23 but they said it was probably the longest running arg on the, on the web um, and so yeah those guys might be worth exploring All right, great, yeah. I guess what I'll do is kind of spread, just, yeah, do another direct approach to a few people here and there, and let's see who will catch the bait. I think that'll, yeah. What, what's the lockdown status in LA? Because, I mean, a lot of this stuff is, you know, networking is done at parties and stuff like that. Is it, it's very much about which parties you get invited to. And so I wondered if there are any kind of events or anything that you could attend, or is everything completely kind of dead at the moment? No, there I'm being cautious on that too, but um there are there are starting to, to have these events and parties and yeah, yeah. I'll I'll see what's up here. <laughs> in in London Nobody gives a crap anymore. <laughs> That's like it's business as usual. <laughs> so I, I'm not, right. I'm not really sure how, what it's like down your your way. Yeah, it's almost similar, I'd say, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I must admit, I I'm a little bit nervous about socializing. I I just I, I'm really you know, staying on the boat a lot, not going ashore much, because there, there are a lot of tourists, and they're like, <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> I don't trust it at all. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we've probably only got a, like another five years or so to go. <laughs> yeah. Here, just on that, just just because you mentioned magic a minute ago, um, uh, you know, back when we mentioned Lionel and you said he was into magic, I, and I made the comment I'd like him to talk about that, but I realised um, I meant, I meant uh, kind of metaphysical magic, not, not ledger domain, you know. What, what is he actually into, do you know? Uh, neuro linguistic programming, um, chaos magic. Actually, the same thing as as that arg that the arg uh, repost that I did. Um, it's it's basically that he spends. Oh, okay. 
He, right. He's been about six months doing a wizard's. I think it was one wizard spell. He spent six months doing it. Six months. Oh, okay. Of so, so it's, it's, it's the real thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought maybe I got it totally wrong, but it's the real thing. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he's written a lot of books on magic and stuff, and with a K. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, all those guys are into Eris um, and chaos. Um, I think it's really cool stuff, but it gets you branded as Satanist very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it gets very difficult with the uh, the Christian crowds, you know. As soon as they get a whiff of that, but it's yeah. I I was no, led but... uh, this week on on this kind of path to Burning Man um, and all of the the hidden stuff behind Burning Man and how they all Satanists in Silicon Valley, and I took it for granted that everybody knew that, but apparently. <laughs> <laughs> to some people, it's greatly shocking. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, it's just the way it is. <laughs> That's how Silicon Valley is. All those guys, uh, uh, you know, Burning Man, they all, the CIA is there, and it's all LST, and it's all a big yeah. sale. But I thought everybody knew that. I didn't know that this was a great revelation, but that's what I learned. Um, well, the but thing is, anyway, some of that magic can be very powerful stuff, you know. Um, and also, even stuff like you put up there with that crocodile Dundee hypnotizing the bull. You know, I, I mean, people can really do that. That's not just bullshit, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, they can do it, that. It, it, they it they can do that. goes like, wrong, right. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, look, So, so on, uh, on, that, on that path, you quickly get to Epstein and his pals and you yeah. get to... Yeah, you know, owls in the woods and you do, up there yeah, in yeah. Your woods and stuff. The um, <laughs> so the, the, and so yeah, the Laurel Canyon and stuff is famous for all of this stuff. But I mean, it's part and parcel of living in California. It's um, you know, yeah. I didn't know anybody would get fantastic oh, about I, I, it, but it can get really bad. It can. There, there have been some serious. Uh, so yeah, Manson and all of these guys, they were. They were all infiltrated by the CIA. And Manson had a lot to do with the CIA and all, yeah. you know, all of that stuff. So it gets dark pretty quick. Um, but that that's the trip that they all on. I keep on saying the guys are bored. When, when you get super rich and super powerful, you run out of thrills. And then that's where it goes. It always goes down that path. Yeah. Because you, you need to get your kicks somehow. And... Uh, you, know, you just try one thing after another, and that's you know that you've got to do worse and worse stuff to get your kick. Well, I think that so was the the kind of spiral that Alistair Crowley was in towards the end, where it was just kind of like it just had to become more and more intense and more and more daring until eventually it did him in. You know, from what I gather. But um, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to go back for a minute. Uh, uh, there was a Chinese master I knew personally for a few years, and uh, he was trained in very traditional old school stuff, martial arts and healing arts and uh, the whole thing. And, uh, you know, he was telling me that, that some of the masters that he was associating with, that they had gone over and they were just into black stuff. That they, they were completely using it for manipulative purposes. Um, and you know, but they were just as potent and powerful as, as the as the guys who were being responsible about it. Um, and you know, they, the stuff they could do, man, like it, it was it was serious uh, powers that they had. It was no joke. Um, you know, I, and I was just uh, sort of feeding that bit of bit of knowledge into some of the things that you were saying, you know, uh, because I don't think people get that, that they don't understand that if somebody can do that, they really, they really are quite, uh, they're quite powerful. But I, I, I mean, the point is now at this stage, uh, I, I, I don't think there's an ethical um, objection to using it to, for, for, uh, to get a result from our point of view, if 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 we know someone who uh, who who's got some 
responsibility in that respect. Yeah, I think it's going to become important as things get more totalitarian. But yeah, the, people don't, yeah, you know, I mean, liberals are kind of white bread, middle of the road, kind of protected, and they think they're no conspiracy theories. <laughs> and so they kind of shock when they make all these connections. Like, you know, Ken Kesey was part of MK Ultra. And everybody forgets that. He was one of the experimental subjects on MK Ultra that they gave LST to. That's where the LST revolution came in. And and all the all those guys, um, you know, um uh what's his name? Alistair not Alistair Crowley, um the um you know, tune in um turn on and drop out guy. Um what was his name? Timothy Leary. So yeah, Timothy Leary and stuff. He, he was all in the CIA and the the so where the the military stops in you know in America and where civilian stuff starts and where all the magic and occult starts is it's a complete um, blur they all overlap yeah it's that, that came up let's find out and so, so like, something I, I didn't know that people are still amazed by this uh, something came to mind uh, the other day too when. Um, Actually, it might have been last week when uh, Tom posted that video about Asimov and Spengler, I think it was. Um, and uh, I'm sure I read somewhere that, that you know, either the US military or the CIA or some US government department had been uh, uh, employing Asimov to advise them on future scenarios and and not just him i think there were other uh well-known sci-fi writers yeah, who Al, were Al ron hubbard and so yeah yeah Al ron yeah. hubbard and all you know those science fiction writers i mean the communication satellite was invented by arthur c Clarke, and those yeah people don't realize how much of an agenda those um sci-fi writers had the, those guys are all part and parcel of JPL and um, Jack Parsons and, and you know they were they were into real rocketry as well as imaginary space travel and stuff so they all bleed into each other and so it, traditionally what happens is if you go like look at the the Nazis they all are cultists so Himmler and those guys they're all occultists and, and Hitler was a deep occultist and uh, so if you look at the Nazi roots occult roots of Nazism, they have a very ambivalent relationship to occult thing. They completely believe in it and they use it, but they also chuck, you know, magicians and stuff in, in concentration camps. So uh, in general, that's the way things go. And when things get fash, and they're going to get fash, they're getting fash really in front of our eyes, or totalitarian, either left or right, communist, or alt-right, they're the same. It's just basically totalitarian fascism, whether it's national fascism, international fascism, they're all the same. But that's that's where we're headed, and rapidly. And so what we can expect is that you're going to need secret societies. And part of those secret societies are people into the occult, black magic, white magic, magicians. All of these people are the essence of secret societies. And, and it's, you know, and and cults and then those become the thorn in the side for for the totalitarian dictatorship so that's you know we sh we can't shy away from that because when, when things go totalitarian you you need to fight back and you you it eats out your soul if you just sit there and do nothing <clears throat> it's the worst part part of all yeah so it's a kind of a, a, a refuge place yeah, you need to keep your mental integrity and your psychological integrity. You need to find ways of fighting back, and the the I think the only way, really, if you in a totalitarian system like whether it's like East Germany or Nazi Nazi Germany or you know Stalinist Russia or Mao or Xi Jinping's China, is is to have a secret society. That's that's the way those guys get overthrown. All the way back to the White Lotus. Secret society and the Boxer Rebellion, and that—that's the way it's done. Is um, 
secret societies. They don't they don't really work as the Rotary Club. But even the even the Rotary Club and things that are really innocent become a real problem for totalitarians because they they automatically networks. That's why they hate the Freemasons. That's why they hate Scientologists and all of those. Adventists and all of those guys, because they are the, the embryo of uh, a system that will overthrow the totalitarian. But you, you see, everybody now, I, you know, you notice this again and again, and especially the stuff that we're doing. Is people trundle along and they come close to the stuff, and then they go, "Ooh, but I, you know, I, I'm going to be anonymous. I'm not going to tell." It's like, don't be a fucking idiot. You can't escape by being a good. B2 issues. So all these people are making a huge fucking mistake. They go like, oh, now I saw something by Uncle Ted. Ooh, now you've got me doxxed by the state, you bastard. And it's like, it's not like that, morons. It's basically, you're, you're in it, up to your neck. The state doesn't give a rat's ass about whether you're goody two shoes or not. It doesn't work that way. So, you know, you, just get with it. You have to resist. There's no... The, the state relies on you thinking that, oh, there's some, you know, path that I can take where if I'm really good and I obey the state, I'll be all right. They rely on you being that stupid and there isn't a path, right? I'll take you back to, you don't know where the state goes. You, today, they all, you know, hey, LGBTQs are like, well, that's f we're fabulous. Why? Because it divides everybody. When they consolidated their power, it'll suddenly be a big no-no. Look what's happening in China. So you, you, one day you're signing up for Extinction Rebellion, putting doxing yourself, and you're thinking, well, I'll always be right because I'm a liberal and we'll always have democracy. No, go and have a look at what happened to the guys in Yugoslavia. All the Jews signed up and registered their names because they thought that if they were good, then they would be treated nicely. So they went and docked themselves, and they, that got them in the chopper. If you, if they, if they had been disobedient from day one, they would probably survive. So you don't, yeah, don't assume that you get through this by being goody two shoes. That's what everybody thinks. That's what they rely on. You're gonna get fucked, and you're not gonna have anybody to help you. So every everybody thinks that they can be a little individualist, go into totalitarianism, and then basically, you know just ignore the other people being hauled off in the night because you're not in the category the nasty category you'll be in the nasty category eventually you'll they'll corner you into something that you cannot do like give up your kids or get you know you just don't know where the state is going to go they will get to something that you find intolerable and then you're going to be on your fucking own without a network why because you were such a brilliant little goody two shoes that you thought you're going to avoid the trouble it's like yeah and you also avoided the fucking network that's going to help you win totalitarians and don't be a stupid cunt get with it you've got to resist shit's coming so anyway that's why we have to talk to these guys. <laughs> these guys are networks. You need to know as many networks as possible and, and you know, navigate them like a jungle gym. But yeah, it's, this stuff is important, guys. I, I just daily meet all these liberals that have their heads up their ass. They don't know what's coming. It's fucking obvious as the nose on your face is what's coming. And no one believes it. They think that it's always going to be sweetness and light and nice as pie. It's not. It's guaranteed it's not. It's one of the few certainties we have that things are going to change. They're going to be unstable. Don't be an idiot. God, don't be well, an idiot. See, this, this, is, um, this is what's happened in Australia just in the past, you know, two weeks, which I, I think most people just, just missed. They just missed it totally. But you know, basically, the the the, the uh, um, it just flipped from being a democracy to a totalitarian thing. They're just laying down whatever they fucking want to lay down, and everybody's sucking it up. It's just there's there's just you know, it, it's been like almost a seamless transition from from one in into the other, o almost like you know what you said about that Jung. Uh, so it's it's called thing, the, the, the anantodromia, you know, the, the, the 
it's 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 called the shock doctrine. So, so the, the the quickest way mm -hmm. to gain control over the people is to terrify them. So the people in charge of the, the governments in charge of us are terrorists. They they openly terrorists. You just saw Joe Biden do a terrorist attack in Kabul. It's basically they are terrorists. So the way they work is a shock doctrine. They use shock and awe. It's a standard psyops technique where you just do some spectacular that scares the bejesus out of the, the population, and then they don't resist. They're paralyzed with fear. It's very, very easy to do, and they all do it. It's got to be such an entrenched technique that it's trickled down to the middle management in American corporations, and they do, you know, project management my crisis. But you just have to, you know, create a crisis, and then you do whatever the fuck you want, and that's what they do. And, and, and all of these things are never going to be rolled back. So everybody thinks they're temporary. If they say something's temporary, you can bet your fucking grandchildren are going to be living with it. So, yeah, it's, it's from here on out, that's, that's the rule. They, they will shock you and then basically put something in place that will never be rolled back. So it's simple. I, it, now everybody's thinking, you know, it's, it's really a question of how quickly you can lose your delusions. The better off you be well, is how quickly you can you can basically say, okay, I'll give up everything that I think I have now will be the best you are. You see, where everybody goes wrong is the kind of frog in the, in the pot getting hotter and hotter. So everybody tries to hang on to this as I still want a normal liberal life. So I'll get vaccinated and I'll get the QR code and then I'll go, and then I'll be able to go to restaurants and movies. Give up on restaurants and movies. The way to think of these things is these are little hints that you shouldn't be doing this shit. That's the way to think about it. So you shouldn't be thinking, I'll, I'll make the devil's bargain so I can start living normally. Do the normal shit that my friends have. I'll have a cell phone. All these things are hints that you should be giving that up. So if, if you can't get into a restaurant because they have QR codes, it means... Restaurants are over. It doesn't mean you have to jump through hoops to try and go to restaurants. It's trying to live a normal life that will get you. So take these as opportunities to say, this is the time to let go. Each one of the hints, the, you know, when you see a thing that says they've got COVID tomatoes, they've got vaccines, genetically modified tomatoes with vaccines. Well, you know, those are going to be fucking everything. What is, it's a gentle hint to you. You have to get out of the industrialized food system. So these things might come fast and you've got to move fast. But don't think, keep on scrambling towards this fucking liberal lifestyle that's gone. Liberal democracy is over. It died in 2016. So don't hang on. Give these things up. If you can't go on and do this or go in a car or say, like, say that's goodbye to cars. <laughs> that's goodbye to movies. These are, are helpful little hints to tell you to get off them. So that's the way to take take them. Yeah. Any anything that has bad consequences, give it up now. Organize your life, and eventually you'll find yourself outside the system, which is the place you need to be to survive. But trying to keep up with the system is how they drag you in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Things are moving like, fast, guys. Yeah, they are, and it's. Like, I don't know, the discourse where I live in America, at least, is completely screwed. Like, everyone's doing the culture war thing of Republican and Democrat. And I'm sitting here and I see the, like, system crumbling and just the authoritarians, you know, are gathering. And one of them is going to take the reins and, you know, fulfill, you know, the system's destiny. That's what I see. And it's horrifying. And no one else sees this shit. And I'm sitting there, you know, pointing and ranting and just they're you know they're just obsessed with oh biden's bad trump is bad you know gnawing at each other and they don't realize that you know that's what those authoritarians want them to do is to just bicker over you know like freud said the narcissism of minor differences <sighs> yeah it's it's obvious they all the same <laughs> nobody wants to accept that yeah yeah, things of, I mean, everybody was so terrified of Trump, but 
I think Biden's made more moves in, in the time he's been in office towards totalitarianism than Trump ever did. Yeah, uh, I think all, all the moves Biden is doing, his failures and his successes are just making it to where whatever kind of authoritarian takes over can, you know, consolidate absolute power and never leave the office again. Yeah, I, I don't know why that didn't happen on January the 6th. There was some, some error in the script. I think it's So that's where it went with some yeah, it's like you. You. I think you all have seen that uh, video. Like it's called, like the keys to power or whatever. Maybe Trump didn't have all the keys to power he needed to, you know, take over America yet. But be, but he's doing his rallies and shit, and I think he's trying to get the deep state and the keys to power on his side. So when his moment comes, he's gonna try and take over. Maybe I don't know. It could be a show too. It could be bullshit. I, but, I, I, you know. I thought so. No, no, I thought so. I got the definite impression that there was a hiccup around about Texas because there were a lot of like strange, you know, little excursions to Texas. And I think probably they needed Texas on board and Tex <laughs> Texas wasn't on board. And so they had to kind of abandon the plan. But the plan went wrong. You can clearly see the plan went wrong. But, but the, if it did, the fallout is that, you know, basically the principle has been proven. So I, ca I can't see that somebody else won't do it again. You know, when, once they've kind of opened the casket, once, once you've seen that visual once, um, that's kind of an established an precedent. So it's, it's not like this stays in 2021 and you never hear of anything like it ever again. It's like, you know, this is a pattern, you know, it's coming back. So it might come back on the left. Yeah, it's a lot of vultures circling. You can see the vultures circling. The, the, you can see these, all these guys, Mormons, the Scientologists, the cyberpunks, the, the libertarians, uh, even the you know the Great Unplugged. They all these guys all everywhere. They're maneuvering. They're maneuvering now because they can see see the system. And the biggest, the biggest flaw in it is is the currency system. Is 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 you know I'm trying to get people to wake up, but I'm not, not, not making any headway. But you see, the, they're printing themselves into a rebellion. They're printing money into a crisis. And so, you know, maybe they're doing it deliberately for kind of debt jubilee, but if they are, they're in a very vulnerable state until they transition to a you know, cashless society or something. But in, <clears throat> so, you know, revolutionaries should be getting ready at this point for a hyperinflation and a and a fiscal collapse. And because you know, anybody that can weather a fiscal collapse, any movement that can weather a fiscal collapse, um, and so I've got the solution. I mean, I've if you know the thing, my proposal about having, you know, the the game. And having it financed with, uh, you know, fake currency and then accumulating gold and silver in the back end. If, if you have gold and silver at the time when they're in a position like the Assignat in, in France, then you're in a very, very good position as a movement. But I'm, I'm sure the guy's doing it, right? I'm, I'm very certain. I'm sure that the, the Pentagon must be, writ, you know, written. I know of one or two factions, but... I'm not close to that scene, but you know damn well that they're, they're factions. And, so, and also on, on January the 6th, you, you can see that it was an inside job. So you can clearly see there's the FBI on one side, and then you can see the Pentagon must have been in on it. And God knows how, how that's, um, you know, the, the fracture lines in that, in the Pentagon. I, I'm not really clued up on that. But yeah, you can see, see they must be there. In all the alphabet soup organizations, there, there must be serious factional divides. Yeah, I, and the thing is, is like with the FBI and the CIA and those guys, they would love nothing more than an authoritarian just to completely unleash them. That's what I think that's what they want. They love that shit. Yeah, the, the FBI seems to be continually on the side of the states on the Constitution. But... The, I think the military guys have kind of had it with this shit. And there's, 
there's a big price to be played for woke. Everybody's been a bit too indulgent on woke. And they, they think it's the, their right and it's, you know, the heads have been filled in by, you know, Gramsci's long march through the institutions and all these, you know, stupid tankies telling them that this is, you know, hit you on the wrong side of history if you don't see all this as like, no, you're on the wrong side of history if you don't realize that, that Woku has a price to pay and they're going to pay heavily for it. The backlash against all that is coming. You know, it's it's much bigger than just QAnon. <laughs> so, yeah. Basically, if, if I was gay, I wouldn't be so flamboyant. At, at this point, I'd be removing my every bit of pre presence I had or any re reference to being gay on social media. I think that's where you should be at at this stage. If, you, if you're out there waving the rainbow flag, I, I don't think that's appropriate at this time. You're going to probably pay for that. Within within years. So, in other words, everybody's being a bit too indulgent. The uh, precaution, feminine. I, I think here too, the feminist thing is is probably, you know, a sitting target, as well. Um, you know, consider that. What was that ridiculous that? article that was in the the Jem Bandel? That lady in the who who wrote something under the Jem Bandel, you know, wanting miles back or something. I, I mean, was a good example of how far gone these people are. They just they just can't even see it when they think they can see it. Yeah, it reminds me of. Every time I see it, it reminds me of Cabaret, you know, Liza Minnelli and Cabaret, the, the movie. <laughs> uh, it's basically the guys are in like Germany, 1930s, early 1930s, and they're having a good old party, not not dreaming of what's around the corner, although it's pretty fucking obvious looking history. But I, I think that lesbians and um, feminists, they, they don't get it so hard. So traditionally, if you look in Germany, um, like the Code 51 and stuff is, is very bad. Uh, you see, most of these totalitarian regimes are very interested in babies. They want to grow their population. They have labor shortages because they need to have soldiers and stuff like that. And so a large part of, uh, you know, national socialism and Soviet socialism and international communism, they, they need bodies because they're very expensive in terms of, they're very profligate in human life. And so they need breeders. And so they're very into breeding and that's partly why uh, gay people come under the chop. The, uh, but for, you know, lesbians and uh, feminists and stuff, they, they're always potentially breeders um, in the eyes of the state. So they never kind of come down as hard. But if you're a trans person or something like that, you, you're a, a non-breeder, the, the totalitarian state is going to take you as um, basically a surplus population. Yeah, well, if you, just, you just back, have to think uh, about it as cattle, we're just cattle, and just have to you just have to think of what what kind of a breeding animal are you? And if if you're not good for breeding, they or milking, they're going to use you for meat, and so that's pretty much how it works under totalitarian and transhumanism. Uh, I often wondered that about the, uh, the you know, the Old Testament and the biblical, uh, um, the, the the biblical prohibitions on homosexuality and that, and you know, when you look at the kind of world that they lived in, where you know your tribe, your village, could be prone to being wiped out, you know, down to a few people very quickly and easily. You can see that uh, the same thing where they just couldn't afford to not have everybody breeding. It, it was just necessary. Um, uh, you know, I've often wondered. Uh, it looks to me as though that 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 was, in a way, the origins of their of their. Um, uh, you know, we call it now their moral position on 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 sexuality, but from, it would have been looked at from quite a different perspective in the actual time that they were living. 
Well, if you look in ancient Greece, then, you know, the homosexuality is completely tolerated on, with both sexes because it was just something that people did. It, it, see, what's, you know, it, there wasn't this idea that there's currently that you have an identity. So you have a same sex identity. And then it means you ab absolute about breeding or something. So, you know, Socrates or Aristotle or anything, you, you know, you bang little boys and that's completely okay. It's not okay after they reach puberty. That's immoral, although for us it's the other way around. And that, but then it doesn't exclude you from having kids and having a wife and keeping a, a homestead and stuff. So, you know, they, they, in ancient Greece, they, they thought of warriors um, as gay. And the reason is, you know, they, they thought that, I mean, Socrates gives an explanation for being gay is that it's, it's good for soldiers because they, they, um, you know, uh, they have basically bond of brothers and they compete against each other for, for lovers. And so that in battle, so that's why they, they thought that, you know, guys were gay, but yeah, it's, um, what, what we've done now is we made an identity out of it. So, so, you know, you're kind of putting a pink triangle on yourself <clears throat> and that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. I wish we could get back to just, you know, like, there's no such thing as LGBTQ. You just basically, any anybody's allowed to do anything. If you know, it's it's this absolutism that once once you that way, you can't go back. You're fixed in this identity. And it's like, I think it's so wrong. You yeah, just, well, you, you can see. To be like, you know, I have to think if, if I want to be gay tomorrow, I'll be gay tomorrow. I'll be lesbian mm. the next day. Yeah. Just you know, just yeah. what the fuck? Just do whatever you feel like. There's the idea is I am gay. Is like. Where do you get that shit from, man? It's just yeah. it's just toxic, and you're gonna pay it, for it. It's it's interesting too, because one of the things I never see is like, uh, at least in my experience, you're what you're attracted like a lot of what you're attracted to isn't really consciously decided by you. Uh, I could never rationally explain why I was attracted to my ex girlfriend, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a what the fuck <laughs> so it's i think it's that way generally with human sexuality but we're caught in this identity loop of yeah. trying to like mm -hmm. uh fucking okay. explain and then, it and it's like dude just stop just go with the hit <laughs> yeah it's like you're human humans do fucking anything and i i mean that in the literal term it's basically uh, when when we were kids we used to say like you know you know, I used to try and fuck anything that moves. But then one day I sat down and I thought, it's not right, man. Why limit yourself? <laughs> anyway, let's get a funny <laughs> joke at the time. I, I was, um, no, I was just trying to think back to something you said to me quite a long time ago. And I can't remember what it was, but... Um, uh, I think I said to you, I saw a uh, a book I was flicking through and uh, it was about the history of gay liberation or something like that. And it, it, to, it, towards the front of it, it just had a photo of people protesting. And it was all, you know, the usual gay rights bullshit like this, but there was just one guy who was standing there in the front and his placard said, I am didn't say I'm homosexual, it said I'm human sexual. And when I looked at everybody else in the photo, his was the only placard that actually seemed to me to be saying something uh, important that, that, you know, that was really making a worthwhile statement. Um, but that seems to connect very much with what you were just saying a minute ago about, you know, um, you, you just sort of go with your sexuality. You don't create a pigeonhole and put it in tie it all up, you know. These identities are so dangerous. Yeah. It's like just, yeah. you shouldn't be labeling other people, let alone yourself. But the other thing is too, too, when but you anyway. see that the, the library's full of books, going back to what you were saying about Greece, uh, you know, the library's full of books that, that, that are, are trying to talk about um, you know, the homosexuality in, in, in ancient Greece and implied, uh, uh, apply this kind of identity thing 
you know, apply that retrospectively to them uh, as some kind of justification for the way people are now. And, and I mean, it's just you can't do that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, God only knows how many academic treatises and all sorts of things were, were uh, produced trying to accomplish that feat. Yeah, we, we kind of forget the, how culturally bound we are to the Anglosphere. Because here in Greece, you, the, the tradition from the ancient times still carries on. I, I mean, I see these guys, they like, you know, meet each other, have a kiss and like hold hands and stuff. And, you know, and they, but they're still married and, and stuff. So the, it's, it's kind of like ancient times still. So you have the Greek Orthodox Church, all the Greek Orthodox priests, are fucking pedophiles as far as I can see. They're always walking around <laughs> groping little kids. I mean, they've always got a little boy next to them. And so, and then um, they, uh, you know, and then you see all the, the, the boys and stuff, you know, blowing each other kisses and stuff. And they, they, you know, they're banging each other and then they still got girlfriends and wives sometimes. So it's still, it still lasts today. But, you know, that kind of fluidity you you in the you know it's so alien to to us in the anglosphere we just assume yeah, that, that you know you have these identities and they're all rigid and you you know yeah. if someone's gay it's freaking labeled to the horrid you know it's just like mm, that that weird. came out in that uh i noticed that in that article that i just spoke about a moment ago with um uh under the uh, the jem bendel one that that lady wrote and uh, where I think there was a line in that where she made some comments about how the men would stand arm in arm doing something, protecting us or something like that. And, uh, you know, the thing that stood out for me when I was reading that was, was I thought, oh, my God, you know, so she's, she's finally we're allowed to touch each other. Uh, but, but again, you can see is just what you were saying. It's, it's very much a thing in the Anglosphere. Um, you know, even down to, um, uh, I think some of those, it was on one of the Reddit posts, um, the, where the fires were in, in Greece, uh, one of those um, reports. And, uh, you know, and I've noticed it before, how you'll see groups of Greek men sit around, just sitting around playing cards or doing, being very familiar with each other and, and, and all this kind of thing. And... Um, that seems to be a rare thing among the the Anglo men. They they don't, you know, they they don't have their little groups. They're all by themselves. They, they, you know, they live with their wives, kind of thing. That there's not male connection, even non physical male connection, is not really there to any great extent. They're, they're all um, <laughs> they're all in this desperate thing with their women, you know, in, in their little nesting box. Um, so sorry, I, I don't quite know where to take that, but just an observation. Well, the the thing that I want to tell <laughs> my role as Cassandra is uh, is guys that all this shit's going away. You know, this this the lifespan of liberalism and woke and stuff hasn't got very much. It basically as soon as the shit hits the fan, it's gone. It'll be it'll just dry up like the mist. So it's not worth giving it a lot of attention. It's important now because of, you know, basically making a movement. You need to kind of uh, make it part of the egregore and the culture that, that that kind of egotism is not tolerated. Egotism and identity that way is not tolerated. But just in terms of your personal expectations is is as soon as we go to war or the some, you know, we get tough times and they're coming. You can see they're coming. As soon as that happens, nobody will remember what LGBTQ stands for. You see, the, what happens is you go into a Jessica Lynch mo moment. So you have the army, you know, one day the army is like saying, you know, oh, we love your identity. And even though you Hispanic single mom, you know, who's a lesbian feminist and stuff, you know, you, you have a great career forward in the military and you can fight fly fighter jets and join the special forces. And it's like, guys, day one in the military, you're going to have one of those people out in the front line. They're going to be captured, brutally raped and tortured. It's going to be a Jessica Lynch moment. The, 
the public goes nuts and the military are told, get those women off the front lines and as far away from action as possible. And that's it. That's the end of it. You'll never hear a fucking peep out of uh, any kind of gender rights or anything. And then it, it's, you just saw it with Jim, Jim Bendel's paper or, or that, that article. I was uh, quite flabbergasted by it because I didn't think we were actually at that stage. But there they are saying, you know, like, hey, we actually need the men to defend us. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, you so say you're not as dumb as you look. You do, the men are going to need to defend you. It's, I'm sorry, man. You can be as butch as you like, but you, you're not going to be a frontline soldier. It's, it's, you see, it, it, if you look, go and look at anarchists and stuff in, say, 1938 in, uh, in, uh, in Catalonia, you have a look at the Spanish Civil War. They had uh, mixed brigades and they had women on the front lines. So women in the CNT, the vicious fighters, you can go and see in, in Rojava and stuff, those women are very, very good fighters. But it, even anarchists would, had to divide women into different divisions. And there was always the problem of sexuality from the enemy because they, they kind of rape you. And from your own soldiers, because they would, you know, basically discipline would break down. A lot of people would spend their time in the trenches trying to make their way towards the women's division so they could fraternize with them and stuff. It's, it's, it's basically a, a deficit. Right? So it just, it's just a division of labor that goes into our genes. So, so women can be very good warriors. Um, and that's not to say that, but it's, it's like, you can't have a gender, gender neutral or gender blind military. It, it doesn't work. What, so, so what these armies do is in peacetime armies go to pieces and they get more and more decay in them. And then when a, when a war starts, they have to roll back the bullshit all the way back to the, the last war and then reconstitute the army. So all it's doing is you're just <coughs> weakening the army. And then when it has to fight, they have to repeal all these years and years of pay equality and gender equality and all of this. You know, it's like uh, you just got to unwind all of that when, when the war starts. So, so and you see now, I'm, what I'm saying is not not misogynistic or, or chauvinist or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. is, is like I'm just telling you the, the reality of it because it's it's not – you know, chauvinist men that reform the it's the woman, it's the the all the, the identities that say get my identity fellow off the front lines. It's it's them that repeal it. It's not the the male chauvinists or the patriarchy that re repeals it. It's it's the, the women or themselves that will, will say get the woman off the front line. As soon as they see where it's going. So at the moment, it's all like, oh, you know, it's a big gravy trough and you get a career in the military and you want to be paid and stuff. So it's, you know, yeah, it's all big jollies because it's peacetime. When it gets to be wartime and you, you have to spend months in the, you know, in the mud in the, in the trenches or something, it's like, nah, sorry, you, you're you going to be desperate to come home. And uh, and the, the, the society at large will will bring you home. It's in our genes. I'm sorry to tell everybody that the feminists and stuff like that is basically it's in our genes. That's basically the woman the it's the woman will hand out white feathers like they did in World War One and the men go to the front lines. That is the reason why men you know, had uh, more status in that it was the price that basically we commit suicide higher, we basically go to war, we just men are expendable. And so, you know, we've had a brief, you know, holiday. <laughs> um, but things are about to get real. And so the holiday is over for men. And um, gender roles are, are going to be back in on day one as soon as things get shitty. So I'm telling you all this, not because I have some feminist or chauvinist or patriarchal agenda or, you know, um, some, you know, male survivalist or any of that. I'm telling you this to ease your heartache, to ease your pain, and to stop the shock. So forewarned is forearmed, and you, you've got to be psychologically prepared for what's coming.
and that's where I'm at. Um, Hugh, uh, do you want to change subject, or do you want to keep going on that? Or I uh, know that's good. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> I've just got a small thing to say, but it might lead somewhere. Going back to the uh, closing ceremony that you you're creating with Lionel, um, uh, you 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 produce the first scenario the first script for that and then sent a message and said oh no we're going to change it we, you know and uh, it, it was strange because when you said that that you were going to change it i was sitting thinking oh okay supposing i was doing it what would i do and um i was rather amazed that 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 i didn't tell you what i had in mind um and you did you did you come up with the second script or did Lionel was it was it you know co collaborative? It was, I'd... it was it was mostly Lionel because yeah um, we we first came up with the we first came up with the thing the first version that you saw yeah and and then that's what we told to Faulty just in discussions. What happened was then <clears throat> um, Lionel went and. And um, choreographed it and, and um, really uh, practiced it. And then found that it, the times didn't work and it was too complicated. So, so he, he said that to get all that stuff on the magic right and stuff, he said it, you would take a lot of time to work with the people and a lot of rehearsing and stuff. And, and we just don't have that time. So then we decided that it has to be radically simplified and we can't do any of the magic tricks and stuff. Yeah. Well, and then I thought I thought it was better, actually. I thought what he came up with in the second one was better. Yes. I thought as it stands now, it's it's pretty good. Yeah. What do you it, think? It do you is. Think it's good? Uh, but I, what, what amazed me, I, I, can't, I, have, well, I don't know what, what I thought was, um, my initial thought was that you would have effigies of all the nasty guys. You would have an effigy of the big bad cop and an effigy of um, life-size effigies of Klaus Schwab and, and Boris Johnson and, and Pretty Prattle and, and the whole lot of them. And, and they would, all of the effigies would be brutally executed by different means during the course of the, the thing, you know, you you would have you would I would have do that, that, but I don't think you'll get you away would, with that one. <laughs> no, but that I that was why I didn't suggest it to you because I thought, look, they wouldn't do it. It's just going too far. But, but when but you these, look at you what see, Lionel did, yeah. Lionel's done exactly yeah. the same thing, but he's done it yeah. symbolically. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, look, so, that was yeah. just yeah. brilliant. I thought it was really well done. But it just yeah, absolutely freaks me. Yeah, I, I just I was just blown yeah, away though. Yeah, basically, like, oh. he he, it, he achieved <laughs> well. No, he achieved everything that that we would have done more explicitly in the in the subtlest and nicest of ways. So basically, that, yeah, symbolically. That's it. I'm looking did, at it. And I'm did like, oh wow, that would that's be exactly it. Explicit. You know. Yeah, well, I I mean I um, hope yeah. that I I'm, I sent it to Faulty yesterday, but I. I hope I'm not expecting you'll come back soon because I think they're pretty busy at the moment. But I hope that they will see see it as such as 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 what it, what it is. But it's pretty pretty subtle, I thought. <laughs> yeah. It achieved it. Yeah, a, I a mean, it's not in <laughs> an offensive way. I think. Um, all right, that, uh, I mean that leads on to the next bit. Was was. Uh, uh, this bit about Russell Brand being the the shaman. Uh, <laughs> that, would, that would be so cool. I, I will suggest it. Yeah, if, I don't know. The, do you, do you is, think Russell is so embedded in being Russell that he won't he won't want to risk no, his? But, you know, but, he'll do an hour. So, no, no. I, I think he, he he probably will see how damn good he is for the part. But the. Yeah. See, it, it hangs on yeah. whether you can see the joke. I just thought it's so fucking funny to have the yeah. left wing, you know, shaman is, is just like to it. I mean, I just think it's so 
cool that you could have, you know, if you could get that as the lead picture in the press, right? As, mm. as basically exactly yeah. the mirror image of of January mm. the sixth is like oh, the, it's so damn cool. One, yeah. It just says, it just, it's just, you know, nobody knows how to take it. Is is it a spoof? Is it a joke? Is it a takedown? Is it? Yeah, they just wouldn't know. But the sensation it could generate is huge because it's so damn provocative. <laughs> In a, in a, and, and of course, it, 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 it as you, but it's, it's full of what, going to throw that out and, ha, and have him as the centerpiece of the thing. Oh, I think that would be, would be, so would be amazing. Yeah, brilliant. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, it, it would be worth mentioning that to Faulty because he might he might know somebody who who has got a connection to to Brand who can actually talk to him. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's quite possible. I'm sure it's quite possible because that might that be a lot more effective. Yeah, yeah I, I first want to see if what he thinks of the idea. If if he likes the format and stuff, but but he might balk at that. You know, might not think that's the right image or something like that. It's, it he might not get it where where we're going with it. But I I just think it would be just freaking brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. To me, it's obvious why 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 you would do it. It's kind of it's half a joke, it's half serious. It's just perfect for for an argo style. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's and, and what just the whole the, capital. You know, everybody in Britain out, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, it would work just just as as you you know as the capital thing worked, where nobody was quite sure what the hell was going on. There was either two hundred things going on at once, or one thing, depending on your belief, or or anything in between. You know. Yeah, yeah, but it it'd be you know half the people would think that you you're ridiculing. The, the far right and half of them would be terrified, like, you know, oh, you know, QAnon's come to, to prison. <laughs> uh, I, I think it would be golden, but I'll, I, I'll wait to see what they think. Mm. <laughs> yeah, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's they a hate it, it's a great idea. Hate it all, it'll, be, it'll be a real blow because. <laughs> I think that basically it, it really, you know, the whole, the whole format and everything, it really sets kind of the vision for, for, for how I think the rebellion should be. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, have you been looking at how the summer rebellion's been going? I, I have trouble looking at that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I just find it hard to look at. I think the answer is not too well. I just sort of rely on everybody telling me what what happened, kind of thing. Um, it's just it's painful I, I think it's to not look going at. Going too well. In, yeah. Like it paint. It's painful in several ways. It's painful to watch people being futile. It's painful to watch the police brutality. It's 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 like there it, it just seems to be so many levels in which it's just really um yeah, maybe it's just my sensitivities, I don't know. No, I, I feel the same thing. I I mean it's it's so excruciatingly painful to see the media. And and the the predictability and the banality and the oh god you know it's like can you come up with something original it's like oh but you're a hypocrite too and all this fucking liberal shit oh it's like oh god crush yeah. it it's so painful I feel the same like, way I just can't watch thing. that stuff. Can't the BBC see see what they look like with that, you know? Like, but you but drive a diesel car, you're a hypocrite. It's like, oh for fuck's sake, man. Just fucking die. <laughs> Just die. Yeah, it, when I when I watch that stuff, I get to the point where I think, 
you know, I'm looking forward to this collapse. I just hope they die horribly and miserably and painfully because otherwise there's no justice in this world. Yeah, I reached my limit when I watched that shit, I must say. Yeah, like, I don't know, the whole discourse thing. I mean, my thought is, like, whenever I get through one of those, like, talking to somebody and they just don't get it or seeing a video of, like, a protest and, you know, it's you can clearly see it's, like, organizing the police are in control and all this. I just think it just reinforces what I've known for since I was like 14 that we're so fucked. <laughs> yeah, that's the overriding thing. I mean, like, you know, this kabuki dance, it's like, you know, ap all this apocalypse, war, and kabuki dance entertainment. It's like, guys, you, you just don't know how you're punishing me. It's torture. But the other thing that's torturing me now is geoengineering because I'm starting to realize more and more that, that a lot of the people think geo especially in britain think that geoengineering is is responsible they're thinking it's we have to do the research because you know that's um so we know and we have that option and they're too naive to see that you know the research is bullshit the research is just to move the agenda forward so it's a public acceptance so that they can implement it. But it's but a plan B. It's plan B and it's insurance says, no, no, it's plan A. Don't be stupid. And now people are telling me, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. No, for fuck's sake, go and do the research. Go and look at Ken Caldera. Go and look at, you know, David Keith. These guys are fucking psychopathic criminals. They on record saying, I'm doing this for the money. If geoengineering, if they can get over the public, public, reluctance to for geoengineering there's a fucking fortune in geoengineering that's what ken that's what david keith is on record as saying you stupid shits and then basically he wants he's funded by bill gates they're trying to make out like bandits because they'll own the patents that control the thermostat of the world they, they basically it's lex luther it, it, what you're saying is not a conspiracy theorist yeah. he's on record admitting to his fucking conspiracy and then they infiltrated the fucking IPCC Group 1, and they, you know, the whole of the IPCC, barring the special uh, summary for policymakers, the whole body of the AR6 is we have to do geoengineering, and these are all the fucking things. And so that's the whole thing. It's a manifesto for geoengineering, and all these little shits think it's okay. It's like, Dudes, when we start geoengineering, we are fucked. There's no turning back. Basically, that is the bow on our coffin. That's the last nail. And these, but and Hugh, it's, it, these it's also a parallel. But, they can't see. but it, it's a parallel to what's happening with the vaccination, where, where plainly it's not going to work. It's not going to solve the problem. But we're using this as as the excuse to keep the whole thing rolling a bit longer it, it, it's just like you know we're gonna we're gonna invoke this magical vac vaccine and then we're gonna go back and everybody can prance around and do what the hell they like but th that's not going to do anything about the virus it's still going to be there um and the geoengineering thing is just the same it's like this magical excuse to to keep to keep going um that's not going to be a cure for anything. Well, they, they fooled all these these kids into thinking that we need more time. We need more time. No, the reason why we're not decarbonizing is because there's no willpower, not because there's not enough time. You can do anything. Look, just if you want to make the world carbon free tomorrow, shut down the grid. Simple. The reason why we're not decarbonizing is because there's no will. And so basically, if there's no will, then geoengineering is plan A. It's not an insurance policy. Geoengineering, as we stand, you're wasting your fucking time going and, you know, moaning about Shell and how Exxon knew 40 years ago and how Britain, you know, must make this big demand that Britain must stop subsidizing fossil fuels and stuff. It's like, while you're doing all that fucking shit, plan A is going in the center frame. So that oil is not staying in the ground because it doesn't need to after they do solar radiation management. After they do solar radiation management, they can burn, baby, burn. There's no reason to stop.
So basically they will put us into about 1,600 parts per million before they finished. And then there's going to be a fucking hiccup and there's going to be a war because solar radiation management is not neutral. It's political. It's strategic and it's martial. It's always been military technology. Weather control and geoengineering from day one has been military technology. Do you understand? Military technology. David Keith, Ken Caldera, they come from the military. They come from Lawrence Livermore. They worked on atomic bombs before, you stupid fucks. God almighty. And these people then say, like, you know, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. So since 1965, the first report on climate change to uh, Lyndon B. Johnson said, there's only one solution. We ha industrial civilization is going to cause global warming and climate instability. Plan A is geoengineering, not stopping, not mitigation, not transition to a green economy. They said from 1965, there was only one offer of a solution, and that was geoengineering. And it hasn't changed. It's still like that today. Why do you think Exxon doesn't give a fuck? You think they don't have kids? No, because they've got this fucking thing in their back pocket called geoengineering. So geoengineering puts them in control. Geoengineering puts them in control of the fucking weather. You know how much control that is? You know, you know how they can keep people in line if you don't make your IMF payments because you're Gambia? They'll say, well, then we're going to shut off your rain, assholes. It's, it's like having you know, a water meter where the, the guy who owns the water system is your biggest fucking psychopath and bully in, in, the, in the world. But the problem is that this is not equitable, right? So when they do you know, marine crowd brightening and shit like that, it's, they know already. They've done the fucking modeling. It's going to devastate China, India, and South America. It's, so it's politically, uh, it's politically a cause of balance. It's a reason for war. But, I mean, think it through, guys. If they prepared to be so ballsy that they're absolutely heading for a thing that is, uh, what it means is they think they can contain and beat China. It means they can kick China in the nuts and they can get away with geoengineering. They're thinking they can shut China up. Now, what do you think ch shutting China up means? China is nuclearizing like a fucking demon. Why? Because they're in the same position as Saddam. They know they're about to get the Saddam treatment. So basically, they have. To, it's just the same as Kim Jong-un. He had to go and nuclearize it. At a fucking furious rate, just like Iran, because they all know if you don't get fucking nuclear deterrent really fast, America's gonna fuck you like they fucked Saddam. That's the the Saddam lesson. They've all got the Saddam lesson. So China is heading for nuclear capabilities that equal the U.S. or or beat them as fast as they can. So in this nuclear arms race, where do you think it ends? Obviously, America's gonna fucking nuke them before they can do geoengineering. Guys, wake the fuck up. What's wrong with everybody? Oh, my God. I feel you. I to so, totally feel you. <laughs> I mean, tell me what it's part of what to. I'm saying is bullshit. Please, just tell me what part of what I'm saying mm. is bullshit. It's not bullshit. That's the thing. <laughs> I guess it's just too much for most people to believe. Like... Uh, I had a talk to somebody about geoengineering and I'm like, yeah, you know, we started geoengineering like 12,000 years ago with agriculture <laughs> and then you give them anti-civ 101 and then it blows their minds. But they're like, no, they can't accept that, you know, all of this shit was a fucking mistake. They can't, they can't accept that, that, that all this stuff stems from, you know, you know, I absolutely cult. believe that, 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 that geoengineering started 12,000 years ago. It's, I, I think, I think. Climate scientists are, and, and paleontologists are being a little bit stupid because you look at the climate record and the temperature goes bang, 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 <laughs> up and down like a horse draws on market day. And then suddenly you get to the Holocene and it's flat as a Dover sole until you get to the Industrial Revolution where it just takes off like a rocket. And they're like, well, you've got 12,000 years where it's flat as anything. And they're like, well, it was pretty convenient because, you know, that allowed agriculture and civilization to flourish. And you say, guys, 
How likely is that? It's as obvious as that if the if the line is that flat and civilization and agriculture is starting, what's more likely is like obviously we keeping the line flat. We basically deforesting. You see, basically things are, we should be getting cooler. Things get cooler because you take the vegetation away. What the vegetation? I mean, they get hotter when you take the vegetation away. You see, what's happening in in normally when you approach an ice age <clears throat> is you're getting hotter. I mean, cooler and wetter. You're getting more and more plant life. The plant life sucks down all the CO2, and so does the sea, and it sequesters it. So that's what causes the ice age. <laughs> so it happened with the Azola event. They basically got all these ferns that went fucking nuts all over the, world, the earth about 70 million years ago. It sucked out all the carbon. When there was no carbon, then we headed into a severe ice age. So, so clearly what's been happening is as obvious as the nose on your face is that We've been doing slash and burn our agriculture, not just in like the fertile crescents, all over Europe and Africa and Asia, and South America. You, okay, you can see the guys are altering the climate. Now all the anthropologists say, but there were only a million people in those. A million people can burn the fuck out of anything. What they're doing is they they taking the the vegetation as fast as they can for agriculture and for hunting. They're doing you know uh, hunting by fire. But they, but you can see that that they hunting and deforesting as fast as they can, and they're holding the temperature of that line. If the temperature ever gets a bit hotter, then agriculture doesn't work; it gets dry, and then basically you go back into get the cooler periods again because then the, the forests start recovering and, ag and agriculture starts to climb. But then, as soon as it gets a bit wetter and cooler, then they can go back to agriculture and they start deforesting again. And so they're regulating the temperature of that line without realizing it. So it must be what's happening. But but they don't recognize it because they've fixated by, oh, there were just, you know, five guys and a goat in uh, the Fertile Crescent. No, they weren't. They, they were doing slash and burn agriculture all over the fucking shop. And especially on the steps and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I don't think they've got the climate record right and the, or the vegetation record and the locality. I think they're screwing up on so many levels. But I think that's, that's, that's where it is. We've been altering the climate for, for, since the beginning of agriculture. And so then it all takes off, goes like a rocket with the you know, greenhouse gases, and then that, that destabilizes everything. It, may, it basically yeah. takes us into a regime where you can't do agriculture anymore. And so, yeah, but yeah, from here, um, here on out, so it means climate instability, not climate change, climate instability. It'll Now it's going to gyrate because well, it's basically a, we've shocked the system. Right? We've, we've done what they normally do, shock and awe to the populace. We've done shock and awe to the biosphere. And so it's from here on out, it's destable. Well, if it's destable, what you've got to do is take hands off. Like this is what I was trying to explain a few times with the helicopters and stuff like that. Is that, you know, you're basically putting control inputs. Geoengineering is going to put control inputs in that are going to overcorrect and meander around. You won't be able to measure the results properly. And the result is you will basically make, you will exacerbate the destabilization. So you will amplify all the wrong moves and stuff. It's obvious that's what you'll do. Anybody that knows anything about flying a helicopter or managing a computer system knows that you know that's what you'll do. You, so what you've got to do is take your foot off the accelerator or the, the, undo the last bit of thing that you did that fucked everything up. Just undo that, reverse that last thing. So if you're on an Apollo 13, you flick a switch and all hell breaks loose, all the panels go red and the needles start going, the alarms start flashing. You just switch the switch off again and stop. You don't leave the switch on and say, well, I guess what I've done is this and scratch your head and say, well, I'll try this. And you'll never get back from that situation. You'll never get back. Uh, that's what uh, I think that's what happened in Fukushima where, where, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, yeah, past and it does it all the fucking time. They yeah, start they've had to take the rods dead. out, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but but they start thinking and they start yeah. analyzing and they start guessing. There, there was a, a famous thing in Gene Kranz and Gene Kranz in the Apollo mission in, in Apollo 13. He was actually in the movie that was an actual quote and it was in actual real life. 
he said basically okay let's work the problem i don't want anybody to make this worse by guessing and that, because they knew that basically the, they'd done so many simulations and they knew that if you if you get into a situation where you start guessing and analyzing and poking around you will fuck it up then they knew that because they've done thousands upon thousands of, of simulations and it's like that's the way it is that's the way it is shoot david keith somebody please god fucking ken caldera shoot the fuck i mean it i mean it i swear man the, the, um, somewhere the earth you, i can saw be fucked around with this exactly the, yeah I, I saw a graph of uh what the earth's temperatures would be like if it wasn't for the amount of carbon we were putting into the atmosphere and it, it clearly showed that we were, were descending into an ice should be just going into an ice age at the moment like you know well on, well on a on a uh, a trend of temperatures going down um so it, it's just interesting to to consider that in light of what you've just said you know that we're we're still uh sort of counteracting what would normally have happened um so yeah i'm sorry i don't know where i saw the graph it was quite interesting yeah but nobody understands these systems and so it's just a question of taking your foot off the brake i mean off the accelerator it's, but no one wants to do it, and that's why we fucked. But it's it's quite simple, and it, it's you know there are a lot of black swans out there. But, I mean, it, in a lot of ways, if we had a war with China, it would be good. Because I'm pretty sure they've they worked out the they've modeled it, and they know that basically we'd go into a nice little cozy nuclear winter, which would stem the greenhouse gases and uh, greenhouse gases. So basically, you know you. I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, balloons and sulfates in the upper atmosphere is not the geoengineering we're going to be doing. It's going to be more, far more like thermonuclear geoengineering with, uh, you know, China being the, the base station. I think that's really where they're probably more headed. And so basically, it'll letting off a few atomic bombs would be a nice little cooling. And they, they must realize that because they've done so many above ground tests where they, they must have checked all of that afterwards and so they, they can probably calibrate pretty well how much cooling you get for, for each uh, thermonuclear device and I, I think that's what they'll probably do so that well, so well they've got to let they it, 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 it explains did. why they're such you know so stubborn about climate change why why they seem so suicidal the continual mystery for liberals is how can they be so blind how can they be so dumb it's like you know, Christ's sake, guys, you're being dumb. Just try and figure out a scenario where they're not being dumb. Well, not, not where they're being psychopathic, but not being dumb. And then you'll probably have it. And the obvious one is they tend to do a bit of thermonuclear cooling. So they're not worried about climate change like you are. And, they, and the guys at Exxon, they, they know they, they, they've been in the same, you know, fucking clubs they've been at the same meetings up in up in Muir Woods there and stuff. So they're in the same satanic cult. <laughs> so they're in on it and you're not. That's why you do climate activism and you have this fucking mystery all the time. Why don't they wake up? How can they be the stupid? They not. You are <laughs> Yeah, I love that bit with uh, um, Sid Smith, how he talked about like the owners of society, like all the liberals or family values conservatives, that their thoughts are as far removed from the, the rulers as their neighbor's dogs are to them. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Okay, so somebody is asking is, how do we put an end to geoengineering? Well, the the way to do it is the, the most effective way is to basically do a targeted assassination program so in the past it's worked like a gem if there's one thing that works really really well is you make uh, popular 
death sentence for anybody that goes down that route. You only have to pop off two or three, and that's the end of that game. So basically, this, the same goes to, for billionaires. If you if you take them out, you can take them out from two miles with a Barrett rifle. You only have to take out one or two, and you save the lives of millions. I mean it. It's, it's the quickest and easiest way to stop this game. The, these guys are bullies and cowards. They see they're calculating. So if if they think they have a 50-50 chance of being taken out by a Barrett rifle if they engage in geoengineering, that will be the end of the game. Bill Gates will be fucking backpedaling from it like he would, said it would never happen. But that's what it's going to take. It's not a – see, they don't give a shit about how many people know. They, don't, you know, they, they control everybody just like they control all these – these young kids who think it's, you know, they believe in the system. You see, all the kids believe in the system. They believe, they cannot come to terms with the fact that these people are psychopaths. So, so they will always, you know, grant them their best intentions. And they will always grant them the benefit of the doubt. And the psychopaths use that. And the way they do it is they tell them, you know, they fill their head with, well, it's prudent because we might get to the stage where we need this stuff. And, and they buy it. They buy it. They don't. They never think the worst, and you must always think the worst with these people. I mean, do, do you honestly think we would have got to this climate situation if these guys were all sweetness and light? <laughs> it's like, guys, wake the fuck up, man. So that's the first way, but the, that is the surefire way. That is the surefire way. So just, if you think that's harsh, and I'm a, I'm a psychopath, let me explain to you. Social radiation management, by their own calculations, will dim the sun's light by 3%. It will mean that 3% of vegetation dies off. That includes crops. So, basically, you, you go and work out how many people live just 3% on the wrong side of the bread line or the right side of the bread line. Well, I'm going to sell you them millions. So, it's like, what's three guys compared to a few million? Take them down, man. Take them down. So... Yeah, it's basically, anarchists did this in the previous century. They did targeted assassinations against royals, and it changed the world. You see, they, they expunged it from history because they don't want you to know how fucking effective it is. But it even happened on the 70s. Yeah, you know, basically, the same things started down that route in, in the 70s with Manson and stuff. It was much bigger than Manson. And they, they were doing targeted assassinations. They started to do targeted assassinations to celebs in in uh, in uh, California, and, and much, much more than just uh, you know Polanski and and Sharon Tate and stuff. There there were others. And and if you read like David Niven, he had, David Niven in his biography, he had just moved up to Hollywood, um, and. Um, yeah, the, his next door neighbor had had an anarchist come come to his door and shoot him in the face. So David never knew that was the game, <laughs> and they all moved out. They all moved out of Hollywood. They all <laughs> see, they they never told you all of this because they don't want to, you to know about the kryptonite. They don't want want you to know how effective it is. But but that was what was going on at the time, and it's highly highly effective. Is these guys are cowards. Basically, they will not play this game after you basically put a price on them. It'll end short. But sure, if everybody's like too squeamish to go down that route, then then okay, let millions of people die if that's only fine on your conscience. But then, then you, uh, there are other ways to do it. One of them is to, sh to shame yeah. these people. So uh, basically, is expose them as nuts. I have a very good way to do this. I can't, I can't tell you because I'm still exploring it. If basically the, the one hitch that I've got is can you find a way to make a payment, a one off payment of about three grand to the government, US government? So it looks like it's either untraceable or it looks like it came from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or Stanford or one of these criminals. If you can, if you can cover up the origin of a payment, then I have a a serious thing that could stop these guys. And it's, basi it's basically a, a psyops and public exposure. 
that, that I think would work. But you, if you can crack that one problem, I can't kind of figure out how how to make that one time payment. But if you if you can figure out how to how to make an, an anonymous or untraceable thing is basically the thing I'm proposing, which would discredit these guys. If they followed the money, they would quickly get back to the fact that it was a hoax. But if you can figure out a way of making the payment, then that. but yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to follow through through on that, and then. Hugh, but, uh, another, uh, another discrediting thing. these guys is the next way to go. If you don't yeah. shoot them, you've got to discredit them. So you've got to do character assassination or, or literal assassination. But Hugh, you've you've got a you've got in a way uh, no shortage of anarchists. It's just that they're completely misdirected and they're wandering around shooting people in schools and shopping centres and and they're just you know. Um, uh, completely missing the point. So, uh, I mean, it would missing part the of target, this, yeah. Missing the target, yeah. And I mean, so part of the strategy has got to be e education. Uh, I mean, if if it's widely enough known that that uh, uh, what the correct target is, then eventually some of these people will find their way to the correct target. Uh, if you yeah, you see, that's what say. a secret society is for, is for disseminating this, this kind of information. Because eventually you have to do it. You have to do it for just self-protection. Right? Yeah. yeah, and then, I don't know, for me, I just find it hard for people not to be motivated to actually do something because it's like, uh you know these 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 so-called rulers you know they've enslaved our entire planet they're destroying all of the poetry beauty and truth in nature you know every almost every human is a slave on this planet now and you're just you know confined to a mundane boring existence at best and at worst you know torture imprisonment and death yeah the, so the, what, these guys you know, if you're liberal and you think you're on a conspiracy and stuff, it's like these guys worked all of this out at Yale and Stanford and stuff. And you can go and read the papers. Some of them are about learned helplessness. They're basically how they tortured dogs until they tortured them into helplessness in a situation where they couldn't do anything about it. And then they found when you put the dog in a situation where they can do something about it, they just cower and whimper because they've learned helplessness. They've, the dog, in effect, has its spirit broken. So then, even if it can correct its situation, in other words, the cage door is open and it can get away from the electric shock, it won't do it because it's it's a phenomenon called learned helplessness. As soon as they realize that, they work to do that on the population. The reason why nobody will rebel and the reason why everybody finds excuses not to do anything and the reason why they're all running scared and scared of surveillance and scared of saying boo to a goose is because they um, they have deliberately put us in a state of learned helplessness. They've done a, a, they've gone to a lot of trouble to make you feel impotent. You're not impotent. They, they are scared shitless of you finding out your power. But you can't if, if you want your power, you can't hold back. Right. So basically, it's it, we are denying ourselves our power because they rely on us, like with a dog with learned helplessness, to find reasons to be helpless. And everybody's fucking expert. Fucking expert. Just just go on Reddit and talk to one of these, you know, go on the anarchist group, and you'll find out there isn't a single rebel in the whole fucking anarchist sub. There isn't a single rebel on the Extinction Rebellion. Because they've trained everybody to find excuses for doing fuck all. <laughs> they've trained you to deny your power. And they, but they scared shitless. All these guys are bullies. They scared shitless of you find using their techniques. You know, they, they, daily, you know, I mean, we've just seen Joe Biden is like, you know, Taliban put a bomb in the airport, kill some 13 American soldiers. They come back with an assassination. It's like, it's like, why is that okay? 
<laughs> why, why is Obama allowed to kill 10,000 people in cold blood? And that's kind of considered okay and normal and stuff, but like for a citizen <laughs> to get a rifle and kill people that are about to geoengineer this planet into Venus, it's like, no, that's psychopathic. Why? <laughs> why? Because he's president. Does he have a license to be a psychopath? It's just, it's just beggar's belief. But that's that's how they, you get to that with years and years of training. Training and breeding and domestication, and that's where you get to. That's where we are. But don't worry, people are going to wake up. You see, they're, they're always enough. You only need handfuls, right? You only need very, very few people. That's the thing. That's the thing. So never lose sight of that. Is you need tiny numbers, and I mean like less than ten. That's what they scared of. The power in the hands of the individual and the lone wolf now is so extraordinary. And they, you know, how many people in the U.S. military? It's over a million. <laughs> to the maths, how many are disaffected there? Those guys have helicopter gunships and nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. <laughs> like, they will turn. It's coming. <laughs> but it, this is the thing that that has amazed me over the years that that um, that nobody's like nobody's broken out like that. You know, there, there's so many people they, in they a have, position where they, they have. Just... Yeah, they, they keep it quiet, right? Mm. See, there's a lot more censorship than you realize. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I mean there's a lot of terrorism going on and a lot more censorship and a lot of people going nuts that doesn't make it to the news because they suppress it, especially in the military. If somebody goes a bit nuts in the military, many people are going nuts in the military all the time. If you've been in the military, you know it's part of the course. But, the, but um, they keep it out of the press, right? The, and it's it's quite easy to do. But there's a, there's a lot of uh, food security and terrorism of food security and stuff. You remember in the 80s, there was some... Um, you know, there started to be these waves of people contaminating foods, food and supermarkets and stuff like that. And um, it, it, you could see it was copycat was starting to take off. And then they put a strong blanket on, on news for a reporting anybody that, you know, kind of blackmails a supermarket chain or anything like that or contaminates food. There, there's strong... Um, agreements and taboos with with uh, media reporting that stuff so it's happening all the time you just don't hear it or you, you yeah you hear it very no, very rarely with it, you, but, you've re it, actually it's reminded all the time me you just want to hear about it yeah you reminded me uh i've forgotten all about it it, it actually happened here about um two years ago where uh, uh supposedly somebody was putting needles in strawberries um and it was probably just complete bullshit, but it just had this devastating effect for quite a, quite a, it completely ruined the the uh, the market for for like a, at least a season. They, they're basically giving strawberries away to get rid of them in the end, uh, you know, like for like a dollar for however many you wanted. Um, but yeah, now that you mentioned that, it's interesting how quickly that just sort of it popped up and then it just sort of vanished completely, and there was. There's no, it was never yeah, any comment, the, never, never the, you know. But if people don't do the mass, I mean, just do the mass. Just just put, say, how many nutcases are there out there that would contaminate food? Say, like, one in a million? Well, there are eight billion people on this planet. So, that, you know, that's, what is that, 8,000 people? So it means that there are 8,000 people eight, 8, 000, in the yeah. world yeah. doing this. Yeah. Or, or more. And it's like you never hear of a single one. Well, how's that? Well, it's mm. because by agreement. Because they, they realize that as soon as that happens, basically the whole system <laughs> falls down. So they don't report it. But you see how fragile our system is? That that if they just started telling the truth about it, you know, it it would it would collapse. Nobody nobody would eat food out of the supermarket. Nobody would shop in the supermarket if they knew yeah. what people yeah. were doing behind the scenes. So it's it's only by lies and secrets that can keep this 
this insane so it's system. it's really yeah. only it's, so in a way it's just much. censorship and control of information that keeps it keeps it alive otherwise it would just come down There's a lot more going on than people realize. There's a lot of self-censorship and um, just just by a nod in agreement. It's because all these functionaries agree with the system. Right? They, they, they um, you know, they're kind of these apparatchiks that support the system. Everybody goes into the, into the workplace and does their little to support the system every single day. And what what makes the system crumble is when people lose faith in it, which they've already done, right? Lose faith in the system. But the moment the average Joe starts working against it, it doesn't stand a minute. See, see that's, that's the key thing is they, they, they have to have it that the slaves don't know their own power. The, the, the slaves cannot know, A, that they're slaves, and B, that if they go on strike, or basically sabotage the system uh, in relatively small numbers. We're talking one in 20 uh, defects from the system, it's over. But the, 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 the reason why it keeps going is because they keep up the hope. They keep everybody's hope. They keep the story going. So in terms of a psyops for a movement is if you can destroy their narrative and their hope and this, you know, Elon Musk, future and transhumanist utopia if if the average person uh loses faith in that goes goes against that um then uh the the system can't stand more than a day and then and so the it's it's a relatively easy dialogue now to have because because their narrative the techno utopian narrative and transhuman narrative no one believes in it. There are a few geeks and, you know, people in denial and stuff, and, you know, they, they just, uh, they're using it as a coping mechanism and stuff, but there's nobody that, you know, except on the lunatic fringe and in Silicon Valley and there's a few crackpots that actually believe in this utopian system. So I don't think there are many people that believe we're heading for this golden age of progress. I mean, this... Steven Pinker is, is like one of the lunatics, but they're not many. So yeah. it's, but they, they still have the podium. So it's, it's in the narrative war and a psyops, it's important for, for a movement and, and an anti sith movement to start making people uh, lose hope in this, in this doomed system. Well, right now, um in the US, at least my perception is that the jab mandates due to the supposed approval of the Pfizer vaccine um, is in the forefront. And we shall see um, if people have the, have the guts to resist and not cooperate. Um, I think mandates are coming for, well, for the military, for uh, frontline workers, for health workers, teachers, schools, government workers. Um, and I don't know if people are going to just go along um, and choose the job over the jab, as they say in one cliche. So it will be kind of interesting and it's going to be kind of a test of are people really believing lies? Um, I don't know. Uh, people will go along with it. But you see, what happens is that it brings out, you see, there are a certain number of people, so a small percentage of people, maybe one in a thousand, one in 500, those kind of numbers that will will be hardened by this so so what what happens is the majority go along but the fallout for the state is is very bad and the reason is because it becomes a point of no return for a number of hardened people so so basically 
it means that the, a small number of radicals uh, get turned. Uh, this is like the final straw for them. And those become supremely problematic for, for the system. So the majority will go along. They need their job. They have learned helplessness. They, they don't understand their real power. But a few people will start going underground, networking, and saying, this is, has to stop. And I mean, we, we're talking about a vertical cross-section of the society. So it could be billionaires. It could be homeless people. And, and they, you know, imagine if a billionaire and a homeless person <laughs> were so, so radicalized, they say, this must never happen again, and we're going to take active measures to make sure. It's like, can you imagine what they can do? <laughs> you need very small numbers. And, and so that's the, the, what the system is doing is, is creating something that's intolerable and is the last straw for a select number of hard people. And that's the fallout of, of this. But if you have a look at, you see, the, the state never cares about the little people. And the state doesn't have high resolution. So they, they see things in terms of masses of people and large numbers. And they think that of that way in controlling people too. So they like to control organizations and stuff like that. But they they almost powerless at the resolution of the individual. So lone wolves and stuff come back to bite them. So if, I, I can just give you a, a, a small example of the myopia of the, the state compared to how the state's actions influence the individual. So that guy in the Mumbai, the, the Mumbai attacks on the Mumbai hotel and stuff in India, the, the, that was a, a Pakistani American. And the reason why he did those attacks was because uh, when he was four years old, his friend was killed when India bombed his school in Pakistan. Now you see, like, think of it from India's point of view. They don't even remember that fucking incident. But there's one little kid who's thinking, like, fuck India. And he grows up to really fuck India. So 30 years later, he comes back. And then out of the blue, devastates India, completely changes the culture. Now they have a, you know, basically the same... Uh, terror, war against terror, paranoid system that we have after 9-11. But you see, you see where, if you look at the origin story of those guys, it's, it comes from the state's forgotten sins. And so this falls under the category on one of the, the state's thoughtless sins. So they don't see it that way. They, they just think in terms of herding sheep around. And they don't, they don't realize. You see, you see, think about it. Within some of this is there are going to be people that might be aggrieved or uh, that, you know, wrongly aggrieved or perceived to be aggrieved, that, although it's not true. For example, somebody could get a jab and lose their mom or something like that, um, uh, lose their mom to a jab. It's just coincidence. But they will forever have it in their mind that, that it, it was the mandated jabs that killed them. Now, see, the state doesn't register those people, but those people go on later to, to cause tremendous trouble for the state. And the state, as it goes and it accumulates sin, it tends to gather those kind of people. So it gathers resentment at, at, at that level. So basically the rot starts to set in from, from the bottom. And you, but you just need one kind of like, you know, the Montserrat or something, you know, the, the black Napoleon in Haiti. You just need one aggrieved slave who holds a grudge for the rest of his life. And he can take down the whole fucking empire. That's how it goes. History is full with these aggrieved individuals that take down the fucking evil empire. And the, the evil empire has a very short memory. But the human being has a lifetime memory. And sometimes many lifetimes. And so... Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. These chances just hold win. <laughs> will win. <laughs> just... All right, I've got to remember that. We'll have a discussion about that another time, okay? <laughs> just, just, uh, I won't go into it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but again, it comes down to this, this thing where, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the measurement problem. So, you know, the state is digital. These psychopaths are digital. They, they try to manage us with you know, metrics 
that, that are digital. And you, the world is analog. The world is analog and fractal and goes to infinite detail. So you can't impose a digital tyranny on an analog reality. And that, that's what these stupid um, can shits I just, are um, they, they're that. trying to, from the beginning of agriculture, they, from the beginning of agriculture, they're trying to s squeeze out certainty and predictability from the system. And they can't because they have a yardstick and that's as far as they can look and nature goes down to the plank then. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Who to talk? No, I, I was just going to think. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, that's um, that's hopeful in a sense that um, the human heart and the human brain is analog, and we have long memories. Yeah. Yeah, it's that. Uh, yeah, th this quote. is this is just a digital disease. It's temporary, but I mean, yeah. what will be? I don't know if we'll survive, <laughs> but but we must fight it. It it it's it, you know it's you can't allow part part of being human is resisting. So so you can't. That's why I say if you don't resist, it'll eat your soul. You can't live under this digital tyranny and e tyranny and transhumanism and the machine and the clock. You you can't live under that without it eating out your soul so it's daily eating you out it's hollowing you out and, and so you 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 are you see you must be cognizant of the fact that you are that analog human and so you have to resist to hang on to your humanity yeah it's can uh, i uh, uh, oh you're uh, going next sorry, you, I just, you, you were waiting you go next Thanks. I, I won't take long. I just wanted to say, in, in regards to what you just said here, it, is that I think this is where you uh, are being quite amazing because you've set up a situation. I, I mean, I find that myself where the kind of rage of a lifetime is finally being given the possibility to do something because of what you're doing. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's just incredible. Because people can be bottled up and bottled up, and they think, okay. Well, I, yeah. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> I haven't done anything yet. I, I well, just well like, but, you know, plainly, plainly. <laughs> moving, moving, plainly moving, moving. <laughs> but I mean, plainly, we're pointing in a certain direction, and there's some some possibility here, you know. Uh, and, and that's that's a lot better than that. Yeah, than well, what, 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 what? what yeah, I mean, what I hope I'm trying to communicate to you is, is that, look, if you, it's 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 not worth, you know, operating as the living dead. It's not worth being a cyborg. It's not worth being a transhuman. It's not worth being a half human. It's not worth being a robot serving the machine. You see, what they're going to do is they're going to try and shape us to fit the machine. See, because the machine can't dominate. What they want is certainty and predictability. And agriculture and the machine and the clock cannot subdue nature. So what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and beat nature into the machines, uh, something that will, will be compatible with the machine. So everything, that's what the, the story of Procrustes was all about, is... is it, once you start making a frame, and you, you have to fit the world into the frame. And so you have to become like Procrustes. You have to chop things off and stretch them out so that you have to fit this, this diverse and heterogeneous world into this narrow frame so you can make it predictable. And so it's a ceaseless job, and, and it's, you're on a hiding to nothing. Uh, every, everything is going against you while you do this stupid task. But they insist on doing it. But you, um, you cannot l be a machine, right? You, you cannot go down that route. It's better to die. So, so what, what I hope I'm explaining to you here is, is, guys, it's better to live as a human and die than it is to sacrifice humanity and live as a machine when you're already dead, but you're just chewing up more life. So if, if you sell out to the machine, you will be co-opted 
to eat up more life. You be co-opted by the cancer to yeah. chew up more life. Yeah. Yeah. And no, this, this is a big game now. We this this game is getting kind of epochal, and we might be at the end of life. We don't know that there's life in other planets. Personally, I don't think there is. So we we might be seeing the end of life on this planet. This is a possibility. Personally, I don't think so. I think that there are too many black swans. But can you know, uh, war would be good. Basically, a solar flare would be good, and you know, a really really bad pandemic. All of them could save us. So it'd be, it's really cool if everybody that listens to me doesn't think it's a disaster. All these people think it's a disaster. It's like, no, you've got to know when to rejoice <laughs> and why. And so, yeah, it's basically all can, can we those maybe things just that everybody else it? who's part oh. of the machine thinks are a disaster, oh. they're not. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to bring something back uh, which might kind of be relevant just now it, it's what divine beast said a, a little while ago which was a he brought a little moment of sunshine into the meeting which is usually so dark um i just want to thank you for that for just saying that you know mentioning the poetry beauty and truth in nature um you know and we talk for a long time and and it's so rarely that somebody uh during these conversations will even just mention that for a moment to remind us of what what it's all actually about um so that was all i wanted just to bring that back for a moment yeah it's like i mean i've always loved wild yeah. animals that's always been my thing and so i feel like in a way the spirit of that led me here and then i realized wow you know as a child like feeling like trapped in the school while i was in it's like yeah this shit is totally unnatural I should be out there with the birds and the wolves and stuff and the deer. Yeah, it's the chaos. It's, it's life is, is chaotic. And the, the beauty of it is, is that it's not lawless, but it's, it's self-similar, it's fractal. So the, it's not uh, the rigid rational laws and algorithmic process. The, all these things, the digital things, are all closed-ended. They're dead, and they. But the the living world is is fractal and infinite. So in other words, you can run the algorithm, but you can't complete it. So all these pursuits are useless. They're thinking in terms of science, and and then they they're thinking they can close the book on science. They'll have knowledge about everything, and then everything will be perfect. But it's not true. Science is a moving window. They think it's in a, you know, you're accumulating knowledge, and it's not. You're forgetting shit and losing touch with shit, and as fast as you're accumulating new knowledge. So it's a moving window, and it's infinite. Science is never going to be complete. It always looks like it's going to be complete, but that's, that's another way of saying it's fractal. So, so the story is infinite. And, you know, that's yeah, what we and, celebrate. Yeah, that's all true. And then also one of the things I love about poetry is when you read like a really good poem, it's what's not said that gets you. Yeah, the negative spaces. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a deep thing. It's See, the, the universe is composed of space. It isn't composed of stuff. So, so we, you know, our whole culture is based on stuff. And it's based on materialism and it's based on accumulation. And it's, but we forget that the, what, what makes all of it possible is the space between. So the mystery is not what matter is. The mystery is what space is. <laughs> Yeah. Well, on that space up note, maybe that's we should call it a day. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's two hours. Okay. But thanks, Hugh. That's one. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh, and another thing I was going to say that I forgot. All right. Well, uh, we better go out with a pause and just hang on. We've got a last minute yeah, announcement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, so, when we're talking, it reminds me of that quote. I can't remember who said it, but he said the, the struggle against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. I can't remember the guy who said that, though. Mm. Mm. <sighs>
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the state hates memory. Part of the thing, you know, that they're trying to do is trying to erase memory. They're trying to, it's, it's the alien cortex. It, it, because it needs to be an intermediary. And so it, to invert everything and um, to substitute everything, it, it needs you to, you know, things to go down the memory hole. So it needs you to forget. And part of the, the thing that's dangerous about wokeism and stuff is, is it's an effort to forget. So, you know, to, to redefine history, to cut off ancestors, to cancel historical figures, to, to erase memory. And that, that's a very important part of power, to pretend that history, rewrite history. So, as George Orwell said. Yeah, so, okay, so, all right, let's pause and get in touch with that space. And... Not space and time, but Kairos time, experiential time, not artificial time, not imposed time, but the time that is connected to space is not the time of the clock or Kronos, it's the time of experience, Kairos. So knowing that, just try and experience the space. In that space and stillness that passes all understanding, we say, Om Paramatma Nimana. All right, everybody. All right. Good luck in the week. Thank you. Good luck. Bye, everyone. Be safe. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.